urbanization, it's a huge trend. But you're an expert on cities. What should our listeners know about cities and how they're shaping our lives in the 21st century? The 21st century has been described as the urban century because in, I think it was about 2008, this was this demographic watershed moment when it was the first time in human history when more than half the population of the earth lived in urban areas. I'm Misha Da Vinci. This is the Griff Podcast, conversations to get you ready for the future. Today I'm talking with John Lawrence. John's a Canadian journalist and editor who specialises in cities, climate and technology. He's contributed to numerous national and local publications, including The Globe and Mail, The Toronto Star, Spacing Magazine, Walrus, Canadian Business, Reader's Digest and The New York Times. He's the author of four books, including Dream States, Smart Cities, Technology in the Pursuit of Urban Utopias, which won the 2022 Writers Trust Val Silly Prize for Public Policy and the Pattis Family Foundation Global Cities Book Award. John has also edited or co-edited seven Coach House Toronto anthologies, including The Ward in 2015 and House Divided in 2019. Cities have long been the most important centres for knowledge, creativity, innovation and entrepreneurship. Today, they're also becoming hotbeds of technology. Smart cities, with millions of tech sensors that collect data, are secretly transforming how urban centres operate. In this episode, we're going to learn exactly what smart cities are, how they work, and what we can do to make sure they work for and not against us. Let's dive in and get ready for the future of cities. Okay, so before we dive in and talk about cities, technology, and the future, um, how did you get into this field? Like, why are you a technology journalist or writer? Accidentally. So I have a degree in math and from the University of Toronto, and I, I enjoyed it, but didn't do so well in it. And I got involved in student journalism. And, and I started out as a, a business reporter because I like numbers, and then became more involved in writing about politics. And then an urban affairs beat opened up in Toronto, and I started writing about cities in the mid-90s. And it's kind of gone from there. What happened with math? Why didn't it work out? Well, so when I was studying, there weren't that many career paths out of math. You could, my mother wanted me to be an accountant or an actuary, which I didn't want to do. You could go into computers. I didn't really, I didn't like computers at the time. I mean, this was not recently. And so, I mean, there was a lot of amazing work going on at that time, but it didn't interest me. I liked sort of pure math and the logic of it. So, so I apply the logic in the way I write, like I try to, I try to marshal arguments and come to a conclusion, but that's the, that's the extent of it, plus the numbers. But, but it's helpful because the type of thinking is useful in your work, it makes you a better thinker. Yeah. 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 And I mean, technology, I've always written about technology. It's always come up one way or another in, it comes up constantly in business writing. I wrote a lot about energy and about the high tech industry and personal computing when it started. So it's like, it's always present in daily journalism. And it's like, I mean, look, at we're having this conversation because of technology and, and it's, it's also really important in my own work from the pre-internet days to today. And so it's, it's a thing that I like to write about as well. Started off in math, got into writing journalism, then started in, in the nineties, you're writing about cities. I love reading about cities. I love when I move into a new city, exploring the city, just driving around. Like I would just forget about maps, just follow my nose and explore the neighborhoods and explore different aspects. And it's fascinating how I'm always thinking like, how did this city develop? Like who came up with this idea? Why is it designed this way? Who made up those names? And it's, to me, it's so fascinating because cities are so central to like our lives and how our lives, how our lives are designed. Cities are going to be even more important in the 21st century than they've ever been because urbanization is is ex- continuing to, to accelerate. It's a huge trend. But you're an expert on cities. What should our listeners know about cities and how they're shaping our lives in the 21st century? The 21st century has been described as the urban century because in, I think it was about 2008, this was this demographic watershed moment when it was the first time in human history when more than half the population of the earth lived in urban areas in the global north and the developed world. It's like 
75, 80%, right? And by the middle of the century, it's going to be, those are going to be the levels in the global South. And so, so we're all living in these compact spaces. And the thing that I think is really compelling about cities is, I mean, there's so many things, as you mentioned, it, it forces human beings to sort of find ways of living together, which we're not that good at doing. We have lots of evidence of that, but living in close proximity, it demands that, that kind of connectivity. You have to figure out how to coexist with people. They're incredibly vibrant spaces for ideas. So for people just randomly kind of meeting other people, cities are sort of these cauldron of ideas and culture and technology and entrepreneurship. And so that's what makes them very vital. So there's that aspect. But then that the last part of it is, is that how do you create the container that allows all these people to live together and to sort of reap the rewards of urban living in a very concentrated space? So now then we're talking about infrastructure and housing and the all of these technologies that go back through time that kind of go into making a city. So that's the sort of excitement of it. Coming out of the pandemic, I think a lot of people, me included, were thinking maybe we shouldn't be living in cities. Maybe we should be living, going back to living on the land and op- large open spaces and not being so close together. But cities have always been centers of growth and transformation and, and progress. Like we need to be bounced up against each other for new things to happen. As an expert on cities, like you've been studying it and writing about it for so long, are cities the way forward? Should we really be thinking like this? Or should we not be thinking, okay, well, maybe now that we have an internet, we don't really need to live close with people? Like general thinking, broad strokes. Why cities still in the 21st century? Do we really need them? Well, first of all, I mean, human beings are social creatures. The reason that the there's this bounce back from the kind of the sort of centrifugal forces of the pandemic is that people like to be together, either your friend group or in workplaces, or it's just, it's, I think, the default condition of most people. Um, I mean, I like, I'm going to talk about climate here because cities are both, I would say that they generate a tremendous amount of carbon, but they also produce the opportunities and the economies of scale for the type of technologies that will address climate change in the future. So if we live in a concentrated areas, we may, we'll use personal vehicles less. And we could find ways of economies of scale for for low carbon and no, no carbon building technologies, for example. And I think that in this century, that's super important. Like this is the century when the human race is going to either make or fail this really existential challenge. And I don't think that that will happen in a very disaggregated state. I think that we need to be together in order to find those solutions. And you think that this the trend towards urbanization is a positive trend, like people, it's okay. Government should be encouraging people to ruralize. It's fine for this trend to continue. I mean, it seems inevitable, but should we support this or should we be like, no, go back to the land, go back to the country? Is urbanization a net positive for humanity? Yeah, I believe it is. And I mean, I think that this is beyond the the ability of governments to, to affect, really, because since prehistoric periods, people have collected, gathered into groups, and first they were family groups, and then they were small kind of clans, and then it just kind of builds out from there. And so it's always about human beings living together in a particular space. And over time, you get cities and you get mega cities and, and these sort of regional agglomerations. So I think it's just the way our species functions. And I think that it's generally healthy, but it's also, a, there are huge challenges. If you have places like Mexico City or Bangkok, I mean, they have tens of millions of people living in a relatively con- compact area. And so these are really big, complicated places, lots and lots of moving parts. And they can they can work well or they can work very badly. So, so that's the challenge. That's the urban challenge. Oh. Super interesting. Your book is about smart cities. It's a great book. Um, it deserved its award. I really enjoyed it. You write about smart cities. What are smart cities? I mean, for people listening in, smartphones, smart cities, we, we know what a smartphone is. We can kind of figure out what a smart city might be but you go into it in depth in your book. What is a smart city? Break it down for us. So the first thing I'll say is that 
academics like planners and geographers and people in urban tech argue about what this phrase means and like they've been arguing about it for 10 years so i'm not going to get into the academic argument for the purposes of the book what i was looking at are the types of technologies that fall under the heading of smart city technology they're primarily but not exclusively digital technologies and they they kind of work to knit the city together in different ways using digital technology and they can be used in infrastructure bridges and highway systems and traffic management they can be used in surveillance they can they have all sorts of applications but the the sort of the differentiating feature is that we have technologies now that have ai and machine learning capabilities we have very sophisticated surveillance facial recognition we have big data and the ability to gather a lot of data not just statistics but i'm talking about cell phone signals and a lot of very granular data a lot of which tends to sort of accumulate in cities cause that's where all the people are so smart cities is this very broad kind of family of technologies that sort of uses those elements you talk about sensors what is a sensor and how does it impact a human being walking in the city or utilizing a city living in a city where are these sensors well, so- Yeah, so there's sensors everywhere. So the best example that I can tell you is when you when you tap your phone to pay for something, there's a sensor in there. Or when you go to the supermarket and you you have an RFID reader and it, it sort of reads the barcode on your cereal. There are lots and lots of different types of sensors. Some of them are expensive and complicated, and some of them are very basic. But ba- essentially, what they're doing is they're counting something or taking making taking account of something. There are air quality sensors, for example, which have, which are able to sort of detect smog levels or particulate matter, and then they take that they take that reading and they translate it into a digital signal, which is sent to something, right? So, or there are sensors that that can determine the amount of traffic passing over a particular point on a street. It might be something that's embedded in the in the pavement or might be something that's sort of some sort of sensor that's trained on the street counts the number of vehicles sends it to the traffic control center so there are lots and lots of examples like that and and they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes but essentially it's taking a reading of something turning it into a digital signal sending it somewhere where it can be processed right so so i'm curious quietly sensors are being embedded at various points and various places in cities that we are not aware of. Right. Where would these sensors be? So you said traffic is one. Like what kinds of sensors? Like can you tell us a little bit more about that because we don't know. All of this is sort of happening quietly behind the scenes and people don't know what's going on. They don't know that if I every time I pass this intersection that such and such is going to happen. Okay, so we know that there are cameras, we know that there's CCTV happening. We know some of these things are happening because they're talked about. But you're saying there're all kinds of sensors everywhere. Is 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 that true? Yeah, I I think that that's true. It's hundreds of millions of sensors are deployed in around the world. They exist in the service of all sorts of different things that aren't connected to one another. So municipalities may use sensors to track whether there's like leaking in a sewer main. Shopping mall owners might have sensors to detect the number of the amount of traffic that's going through or using some kind of cell phone monitors to sort of push advertising at people. It's a very diverse set of objects and they do different things. And some of those things are quite benign or useful. Mm-hmm. Like you want you don't want to have a le- if you have a major water main you're in Los Angeles so you're you're very familiar with water scarcity issues so you want to have it makes good sense to have sensors and water mains that can detect drop off in and water flow because there's a crack in the pipe somewhere that's right. a useful thing yeah. whether sensors detecting whether somebody whether there are the number of people in a park for example i think that that's more problematic and we had this big conversation in Toronto about sidewalk labs which was the the Google subsidiary the smart city subsidiary that tried to set up in Toronto and one of its premises was that it would it was going to build out this bit of 
brownfield on the lakeshore. And it was going to fully equip it with sensors and all sorts of sensors. And to your point, you don't really know what exactly they're reading. Right. And we can come back to what people should know, what yeah. the questions people should ask, but they are very ubiquitous. In your book, you talk about all of these different things that are in smart cities as sensors, your digital video and facial recognition, which I think people are a lot more familiar with because we've been hearing about CCTV yeah. and facial recognition technology for a long time. Uh, but you also talk about Internet of Things. How is mm -hmm. that being deployed in smart cities? So the Internet of Things is a, it it's this concept that if you have, let's say you have an office building that <clears throat> has a sensor on doors to detect whether they've been opened or not. And all of those sensors are connected either wirelessly or through digital fiber to some central like control center. They together make up an internet. Like it's like there's a network there and they can they can monitor all of those doors, for example. So that's sort of what an internet of things is. And the the things is in that phrase is all the objects that may have a sensor attached to them could be a one of those Apple luggage, those those discs that you put on luggage to find it at the airport. That's connected to to an Apple app or some other some other app that allows you to sort of find that thing. That's what an Internet of Things is, and it's it's got or many nodes all over the place wherever there's an object that has a sensor on it. So. Sensors connected to the internet, basically, and yeah. connected to all the various devices throughout the city or buildings or whatever it is, wherever it is, there's human traffic, I'm, I'm assuming. It's about yeah. human traffic or infrastructure and wanting to track changes in these things that people are trying to track. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Now we have, and now we have AI and machine learning. That's a whole... Right other layer to, to all of this. What is your, in smart cities and as smart cities expand and grow and advance, and currently like with this whole AI explosion, what can you tell us about AI, use of AI and machine learning in smart cities? So, Or in cities in general, like what, yeah. you're in Toronto, I'm in Los Angeles. What are they deploying that we don't know about? Or we should know about? One of the key features of a lot of smart city technology is it collects a lot of data. It could be traffic data, it could be readings of wastewater, all sorts of data. And the more data that exists, the more opportunity you have to sort of look at it and try to figure out patterns in that data. And that's where AI comes in, because AI is basically the type of software, type of computer program that looks at very large sets of data, tries to find patterns in it, and then makes predictions about those patterns, right? There's AI in a lot of traffic systems now where you have sensors picking up traffic information, and then they have so much of it that you can sort of start to make predictions about how the traffic flows will be on a certain day under certain conditions, and then you could adjust the traffic lights, for example, or lane closures or whatever. So that's where AI comes into it. It comes into it in, with facial recognition software, which we can talk about, which is all about security and policing and so on. AI is coming into everything we, we do, right? Like you can, you don't have to talk to customer service for your cell phone provider anymore. You can go onto the chat and there's an AI bot at the, at the other end of that chat. So it's really become very ubiquitous. Nice. I'm personally hoping that it's not going to replace me, but that's, that's, yeah. that's, that's for another conversation. <laughs> I think technology is great. I think technology advances the world and can provide many, many solutions for humanity. I'm not a techno-optimist or a techno-basher. I think it, the question is, is this technology going to serve people? Is it going to improve people's lives a large right. for a large number of people? Yeah, maybe it'll improve the lives of the people who deploy the tech. They're going to make a ton of money, right. right? Like in your book, you say, more use cases, more ROI. That, right. that, that was one of my favorite lines in the book. It's like, more use cases for the tech, more ROI. And of course... So for people deploying the tech, it's, it's, it's business, it's income, it's big money. 
but for people, regular humans, is this technology a net positive? And I think that's how we should be looking at technology. We should be evaluating technology. And is it a net positive for a right. large number of people? So I like the idea of smart anything. If it's smart, it's more information, more data. We can use it. We can improve lives. We can build new things. We can create new possibilities. We can make a better world and make a better future for all kinds of people. It sounds great on the surface of it, ostensibly, but really and truly, as an expert on this, John, are smart cities better for humans? And I think that brings us to the question of privacy and surveillance, because, I mean, really, that's where it bounces up against us most. Right? Are we losing something valuable because of all of this technology? Are we losing our privacy and our humanity, our dignity, our rights as humans? And is all of this surveillance, which we, we sort of say, well, it's going to improve X, Y, and Z, is it really improving anything? In the long term. So, yeah. I mean, so these are really difficult questions. So, I mean, I'll begin this way. One is that we, we've we already kind of gone past the point where we are willingly giving up all sorts of information about ourselves all the time. You use social media. That's the way it is. You, you, you click the wrong box when you go on a browser. Suddenly you're getting cookies. So all of that exists. And there's a debate about whether or not it's insidious. The The point where cities come into it and smart cities come into it is that I think that when information is being collected by governments on behalf of residents and taxpayers and voters, that there's a higher bar. They have to, they have to really explain why they need to do that, kind of undertake certain types of surveillance or data collection. And justify it and then keep it proportional. You don't want to you don't want to give governments carte blanche to just gather data. And I think this is particularly true in public space. One of the one of the things that really makes a city is its public spaces. Right. And so and that's what that's why cities are fun, right? Is that they they have this vibrancy and the vibrancy is outside. It's between the buildings. And so if we are beginning to really kind of surveil those areas with technology that's not static, like the old school CCTVs, it's a video feed somewhere. It's not really, it's not useful proactively because there's so much of it. But the when you start to sort of use sort of the big data tools like facial recognition, then you get into a kind of a different storyline. And you and I think that really the onus is on. There's there's a double onus here. One is the onus is on governments to explain what they want to do and be very precise about it, and then stick to that. And there's also an onus on the part of people who are living in cities to expect that of their governments and to speak up when that's not happening and to be critical consumers of technology. Like we should be critical consumers of technology because it's so transformative. We've all been through this pandemic when we we all know people who've spent way too much time in rabbit holes finding information and then using it in ways that isn't really helpful or is harmful, actively harmful. And so that's a kind of misuse of technology. It's not a critical it's it doesn't it's not critical engagement. So that's what I'm talking about with the with the smart city stuff is that because it's because it's primarily public, that there's a different kind of set of standards. So when we're, let's say I have a smartphone, I, every time I go on a website, I give up my, I give up some of my privacy in order to have free, a free service. We know that, but it's my choice or uh, right. to some degree. I mean, in some cases you have no choice. You have to use this technology, but but still, I'm actively using it. I am going online. I'm taking an action. In cities where I live, I'm just living my life. I may have lived in the city for my whole life. And this, the environment's changing around me. And my privacy is being compromised. And, and we know that legislators and regulators and, and, and municipal leaders or whatever, the length of time it takes for them to make decisions about 
stuff. It takes months and years. Whereas technologists and tech companies, startups are deploying these innovative new technologies every month, every week, <laughs> whenever I am in different use cases. Yeah. Our representatives have an obligation, our governments have an obligation to do certain things and act in a certain way and protect citizens, blah, blah, blah. But that's just not what's actually happening on the ground. What's actually happening on the ground is text happening, text being deployed way faster than governments can react. Right. And most of the times legislators, and they have no idea about this technology. They don't know what's going on. 99% of our legislators have no clue about technology. So they don't even know the questions to ask. I, I remember watching recently the in the United States, the Senate, one of the committees were interviewing all the AI leaders. And right. it was a joke because here are these tech big wiggies sitting there talking to these tragical senators who had no idea what they were doing. They were asking the overlord, please, sir, tell us what this is. What, how should we correct you or how should we curtail your behavior? It's like, come on, seriously? Um, so I think it's accurate to say that our governments and our municipal leaders and our city councils, they should be doing X, Y, and Z, but they're not capable of it. And so in the meantime, it's on us as citizens, as individuals to get really smart, educate ourselves and know what's going on and how to best navigate it. Like Amazon's ring is ostensibly to protect your house or your home or your apartment or your whatever from intruders and blah, blah, blah. But it's just a surveillance mechanism for Amazon and it's just tracking everybody's behavior. So let's say you live in an apartment building and somebody puts up a ring on their door in your apartment building. So you have to pass this ring every single time. And all of a sudden your privacy is invaded. To me, these are deeply problematic things. So <clears throat> I was in Germany last week for work and also it was a sort of junket about smart city stuff. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because this question about privacy kept coming up mm -hmm. a lot. and. In Europe, the privacy and privacy legislation and the whole regulation of, of all of that, this broad sort of family of things that we're talking about, is, is far ahead of North America. And I think that, I mean, the United States is far ahead of Canada and Europe is much more attuned to these questions. I'm not a political scientist. I'm not sure why it's more of an issue in, the, in Europe than it is here. But I do... I do think that there is more talk about this like the I, like I'm glad you mentioned this this hearing about AI and I thought so I totally take your point about the the sort of superannuated senators sort of not knowing what they're talking about when they ask these questions but on the other hand I do think that it's good that it's that the whole all the issues around the chatbots and the large language models and all of that like burst into the public debate and the regulatory debate quite quickly, all things considered. There are examples where where governments have actually been able to sort of do something. So there's a there's a I think it's kind of an interesting, interesting effort. In New York City, the city council passed this law. It's called Local Law 97, I think. Maybe not 97. But anyway, what it does is it requires all employers within the boundary of the city of New York to adhere to certain basic standards when they use AI in hiring. So AI is a big tool for sifting through resumes, but it can be kind of insidious because there are ways of figuring out who you don't want to have, you know, who, who you want to keep out. And so the city said, okay, well, we're going to, this is an issue. We want people to come and work in the city. We want our employers to hire fairly. And so everybody in New York, if you're, if you have employees, you have to meet these basic tests. And that's not a thing that city municipalities normally do. I mean, municipalities, they, they clear the garbage, they run the pipes, that kind of thing. So it's, it's a sort of, I thought an interesting new example of where this might be going. And it's, it's, it's perhaps telling that it came out of a city and it came out of a city that's where 
the political culture, basically since Michael Bloomberg was the mayor, has been very oriented towards data, the use of data, use of technology in the service of municipal government. So so that's some cause for optimism. I mean, I think there's lots of cause for skepticism. I mean, there's another good example in San Diego, where about six or seven years ago, the city of San Diego bought like four or 5,000 smart street lights from General Electric. And what these were going to do, they were LED lights. So they were going to cut, they were going to shave tens of millions of dollars off the city's energy budget. And they were going to keep track of the traffic in bike lanes and on parking. And then it turns out that the police in San Diego discovered that they were actually pretty good for investigating and monitoring neighborhoods. And this created an enormous back backlash. There was like, it was like a big, big political fight. The city actually had to go so far as to unplug the system because because there were concerns about human rights abuses, surveillance in, in neighborhoods with predominantly Black and Hispanic populations. And the outcome of that is that the city has created a sort of an advisory body of citizens to kind of review this kind of technology, right, before it gets installed, right? So it's a it's a way of saying to the public, you have to have a look at this. You have to think about it. You have to think about the possible benefits and also the possible negative outcomes and tell us what you think. So I think those are both pretty cool examples of how you how governments can engage with these very powerful technologies. Beverly Hills is a very highly surveilled small city yeah. within the LA area. Like, should we right. be concerned? Our image is being captured everywhere. So I think some people would say, look, I'm not doing anything wrong. I don't care. I don't care if somebody has my data. I think that's actually the totally wrong position. Most people don't commit crimes. Most people are not going to do, are not doing anything wrong. Most people have no reason to be concerned about being policed. But if people have your image, they could do whatever the heck they want with it. At some level, somewhere, someone can manipulate your image and control your identity. We are being surveilled and then Man, con controlled and manipulated in subtle ways that we're not even aware of yet. Um, so it's really, really cool to have you here to sort of walk us through this. Even a, beyond the level of capturing people's data and their images and so on, I think that what it does is it it's, it erodes trust among people who share urban space. Like, like the only way, the only way that we could live together is if we have a measure of trust with the people who are around us. And if we sort of outsource that trust to devices that that are doing all these things or tracking, then you're really kind of undermining what it is that's good about cities. So these are, and you, this is the kind of thing where you have to really think about what you're doing, right? You We have to think about participating in that or not participating in it, right? Because some choice of buying a ring or the the nest or all those sort of doorbell technologies like i don't i don't want one like i don't want to be kind of looking at the person who's standing at the front door it's not my business and and it just sort of makes me feel more fearful and it creates that sense so anyway sorry that's a rant there you talk about smart city mega projects in in chapter 9 of the book which is super fascinating um what are these smart city mega projects? Where are they happening in the world? And what are they going to do? Like, what, what's the net result of this? The, the mega projects, the best, best example is Hudson Yards, which, is, which was this thing that was built on the west side of Manhattan by Dan Doktoroff, who, who was the co-founder of Sidewalk Labs. And there are other examples, Songdo in South Korea, which is near Seoul. And essentially, they're big, very suburban kind of developments that are wired completely like they're totally wired they have like every kind of digital device and digital system in them from energy monitors to to sensors and pedestrian traffic and that kind of thing and this is what was proposed for toronto in one part of the downtown waterfront and there, a lot of people had a lot of problems with it because it's too much at one point like in in one place you have too much technology and it's not, they're not real places. They don't feel organic at all. They're, they're very corporate and they're, they don't have that kind of, they don't have that granularity that 
good, great urban spaces have. So not a go, not, not good. We don't, we don't want these uh, smart city mega projects. That term is used as a marketing device mm. for by large mm. developers. It, you know, it, some large commercial tenants or people who want sort of a lot of security in their residential spaces, they say, okay, well, that means that I have like really sort of fast bandwidth, EIF, really excellent connectivity or whatever. But cities are organic spaces that sort of develop from the ground up and really don't work well when you just sort of try to f- create something, some sterilized thing, right? Yeah, I think that's the essence of a city. I mean, it's always a, it's like this constant balancing act between private interest and public interest. Yeah. But if you have too much capital dropping into one spot, that's that's got too much technology in it of the sort that you've described, then it doesn't feel urban at all. Like you can, and that's with or without technology. You look at the convention center that was built in downtown Detroit, for example, it just sits there, right? It hogs the whole waterfront and it's not urban in any way. It's just a big, it's it's exclusive. Do Do you know what's making me think about, you know, when cities get the Olympic games, like Rio did in 2016, and they put in all these big stadiums and they do all this stuff for the games. And then a few years later, they're just rotting. Mm -hmm. They're covered in vines and they're falling apart because they were not organic to the city itself. They were like a superimposition and it's a disaster. What it all leads us to thinking about is the value and importance of many people being involved in shaping what it is we collectively build. Because great cities are, they're really like built by the people who live there over a long period of time. And then they become super cool, sort of organic thing. Barcelona is a city in your book, which you talk about as a, a smart city, a very smart city. How is Barcelona doing? And, and can we expect that? What's the, by 2030, are more cities going to become smart? Or is this a term that's actually going to stick around? Like what's happening? 2030, 2040, 2050. What's your, your perspective? So I think that what cities like Barcelona do is that the municipality is, it, it approaches smart city tech in the following way. In, they want to embrace it. They want to use it where it's necessary to be used. And they want to do so in a way that respects the city's democratic principles. So it's not so there's a high level of public engagement in Barcelona. The the tech tends to be, it's, it's, it's not sort of overarching. Like it's not a, they're not these giant systems that the municipality Im- implements. It's they're more discreet and they're more focused on, a, on dealing with a certain issue that is some, some kind of problem. And, I think that's a generally smart way of going about it. Cities in many profound ways are technological inventions. I mean, we have all these city, these urban technologies that go back to the beginning of recorded history. And the digital technology is just sort of the latest iteration of that. So it's going to be part of the urban space, right? But you want to do it in a way that that doesn't kill what's good about urban space. So you take your example of Beverly Hills, where you have way too much surveillance, way too much private space at the expense of public, at the public realm. And you have as a baseline assumption that if you're, if you don't live there, you shouldn't be there unless you're a security guard. And that's not the kind of right approach, I think. Like, I think that you want, you want cities to be shared spaces. And so Barcelona is not building a mega city like Hudson Yards or Songdo. They're using these technologies in more discreet and sort of directed ways. So it's, I think it's a pretty good approach. It's definitely the, the thinking there is very progressive minded in the sense that they want residents to be engaged in these conversations about how these technologies impact their lives. The book came out, Dream State, Smart Cities, Technology and the Pursuit of Urban Utopias. It came out last year. While researching and writing the book, what did you learn that surprised you? One thing that did surprise me, because I, I spent some time at a very large smart city trade show, is that for all the hype, 
and there's like an enormous amount of hype. There's a lot of, a lot of these systems are kind of half-baked. They don't quite work. They're oversold. It may be that that's just where we are on the continuum. It's like that moment 15 years ago when your phone was this big and it could only do three things. So it's it's possible that yeah we had this conversation in ten years that, that all of that uncertainty would be worked out. So that I found surprising. I think I was I, there are things that I found encouraging. There are some cities that became very preoccupied with like finding a tech solution to something, and then realized that actually that wasn't the solution that they were after. Right, that the solution was more about urban form or density. Right, but the more conventional ideas about city building are not obsolete. The tech becomes part of that story. Here's an example, which I think is a great example. I think in many, many places, I'm sure, I don't know if this is true in LA, but certainly true in Toronto, there was that the provision of mental health services and psychological services was very poor and uneven. So the people who needed it weren't where the counselors were, and you always had to go there. Because of virtual platforms and the pandemic, a lot of that migrated online. And I think it was generally a good thing. So it, it actually produced an improvement in the way we live. There are those kind of examples, and, and they become part of the fabric of the way the city works, right? Paris is a good example where in the pandemic, they realized that uh, to kind of address urban congestion and to deal with vehicle emissions and all of that stuff, that the city had to completely change its thinking about what goes on in the street, right? So you have to have more bus lanes and you have to have more cycling lanes and you have wider sidewalks and just a lot less space for traditional cars. And that was not a technological solution. That was about planning. That was about thinking about how do you decarbonize a city. And so so perhaps in the conversation about smart cities, these these other solutions come up, right? And we could revisit things that are that always have worked, right? That always worked, right? There's always spaces in cities where there are markets, right? So we have a massive e-commerce industry that's sucking a lot of the life out of the retail sector, but people will go back to places where they can buy and interact with other people. So so there's this cycle, which I think is encouraging. It's surprising in some places and other places it's not happening. And so, which is kind of unfortunate. So those are a few of the takeaways that I would, that come to mind. The problem with this book, I should say, is that, is that the technology changes so rapidly that only it's, it, it's been out for a year. I finished the research about a year and a half ago, and I could write a whole other section now because of the way because of the the advances, the advances. in ChatGPT and so on, yeah. Uh, yeah, the generative AI that came out since then. Yeah. So this podcast is about getting people ready for the future. What can what can individuals do to prepare for the continuing smartification of cities and from your perspective, how can individuals safeguard their privacy and their human rights and their dignity in environments where they're not even aware necessarily of how they're being recorded or surveilled or whatever? Like, what can we do as individuals, given that our governments can are maybe a couple decades behind the technologists? Right. As individuals, what can we do? And moving into 2030, 2040, 2050, because most of us are probably going to be here for the next 30 years. And the next 30 years are like monumental changes going to happen. What are you seeing from your perspective, from your research? What does the individual need to know and do in response to all of this? Apart from getting on the case of our representatives and our leaders and saying, y'all need to do this. What can we do day to day to safeguard ourselves and make good choices? in cities, in these smartified cities? Well, I do want to reiterate the point that that being really engaged in these conversations and engaged with policymakers is super important. It made a big difference in Toronto because we almost got sidewalk labs in this very surveilled space. And there were a lot of people who came out and said, this is not the right thing to do. And it made a difference. So that engagement is important. And I mean, like I'm a city hall reporter. Municipal government is it touches your life most often in most parts of the day and people don't vote. So you have to engage with local government. You need to think about what the city is doing on on your behalf and ask those questions. So I get to point to the example of San Diego because the 
the backlash against this, these smart streetlights, the smart streetlights came out of basically backroom lobbying by General Electric. They had a friend in the mayor's office. They had a very friendly procurement for a lot of money. The people who were living in neighborhoods discovered that they were being used by the police and they pushed back and they got them turned off. And I think there's a good lesson there. It was too much and they weren't convinced that it was being used. These these technologies were being used for the purposes that they were told they were going to be used. And then they, they had that engagement. It takes effort. You have to go to a meeting or you have to contact your local counselor. You do all those things. But that's part of a responsibility that we have living in an urban space. So that would be, that's my best answer. I think you're absolutely right. In private spaces, we can be more conscious of what it is we're consenting to when we go on the website, blah, blah, blah. But in public spaces, we need to engage with our local government way more. And the smartification of our cities is sort of requiring that as citizens, we get far more engaged and far more involved in what's going on. Is in some of these cities, is there some place you can go where you can see what's happening, like what decisions are being made with this kinds of technologies? Can you go on a website and see, oh, this technology is being deployed at here here and here, or that's happening here? Or, I mean, shouldn't we at least, well, I, I, shouldn't we require that our local government at least yeah. do that to begin with? Well, I mean, a good place to start is, is the local government website. And I have to say that the United States has pretty good laws about, like sunshine laws, about making public information available. It's just as easy as sort of going online, digging around a little bit instead of spending some time on TikTok or whatever. So that's, you have to kind of poke around and there are advocacy groups. There are all sorts of advocacy groups for human rights and civil, civil liberties groups. So you can, you can get involved with those groups, which have done the research for you, right? They've, they're on top of it. So that's, that's another way of kind of being engaged in these conversations. Yeah. Technology is a net positive. It's not the technology. It's like who's behind the technology, who owns the technology, who's deploying the technology, and what is their agenda, and what's actually what's actually really happening in this whole arena of smart cities. What's one action step that listeners can take to get ready for the future, the future of cities? One simple thing that you can do is you can go to your local municipality's website and you could type in smart city in their search engine and see what comes up and see what they're doing. That's a place to begin. And then you could pull that thread. It may be that they're not doing anything at all. It may be that there's a great list of stuff and you read through it and you think, okay, well, that makes sense. And that I'm sort of concerned about. And that that would be the first that would be a way to begin. I mean, it's a very big topic. Some smart city tech is about just digital backbones of large organizations and it doesn't make any difference at all in people's lives and others. It's, it's very intrusive. So that would be, that would be what I would suggest. I think it's a great, great action step for people to take. So what, what did I not ask you? What should I have asked you that I didn't ask you? Or is there anything else we should touch on before I let you go? When I was researching the book, I kept finding out different different types of technologies. The way I began to sort of classify them in my mind is whether they were oriented towards people or systems. And the ones that are oriented towards people are problematic, facial recognition, all the biometric stuff. With systems, it's a kind of a different story. The most positive application of smart city technology is smart grids, and just changing the way the electricity system works. So, I mean, there are two parts of the electricity system. One is where you're getting that power from, like, are you getting it from hydro and from from wind, or are you getting it from burning coal? That's the upstream part. And then the second is, does your electricity system bring in uh, forms of renewable energy, solar, wind, biomass, whatever. Right? And if the answer to the second question is yes, then it's important because that is a much more distributed type of energy that requires these very complicated uh, controlling systems that manage electricity flow. And that's smart grid technology. Um, and if we, if you accept the premise that we need to have an energy transformation transition to more electricity, but more green electricity, 
then that's the precondition to having it done. If we want more wind and we want more solar, we want more energy storage. And California is great on this topic because there is really a lot of work being done on it. Getting your cities off natural gas grids so they can get heat from heat pumps and so on. But on top of all of that, you need to have smart grids, which are not consumer choices. They're, you know, these are things that utilities have to deal with and, you know, you know, state or provincial regulators. But the investment in that is really important as a part of the energy transition. I tried to take a balanced approach in the book and say that there are things that are really problematic and there are things that are quite positive. And I would put that one in the, in the latter category. This was amazing. Thanks. Thanks for coming on, John, and sharing all of your research and smart understanding of smart things with us. Thanks very much for having me on. Make sure to listen, follow, and subscribe for new episodes wherever you get your podcasts and on our YouTube channel.